Welcome back to DC EKG. This is Joe Grogan with Eric Euland, and today we're joined by Mark Paoletta. We're being broadcast by Big Wig, Big Wig Media's podcast network, and we are uh, pleased to announce our new partner, Evergreen, which is distributing this podcast. Today we're going to talk about two subjects, oversight investigations and Mark Paoletta's uh, new book, which he wrote about Clarence Thomas, Created Equal, right here. Uh, we're going to start, though, on the congressional investigations. Uh, Mark, you've been around the block uh, in Washington, D.C. for many years on both sides of the investigations um, uh, lens. You've led congressional oversight investigations, and you've represented companies and individuals that were subjects, the subject of investigations. I think a lot of people uh, think about congressional investigations and they're cynical about it. They think it's just a show. Uh, maybe the first question is, why is it important for Congress to engage in oversight either of private sector actors or of the executive branch? Yeah, I, I spent 10 years on Capitol Hill as a chief oversight counsel for a big committee, the Energy and Commerce Committee. And we did a lot of great things. When oversight's done right, it's a, it's a very important tool for the American people to see what is happening inside agencies and to hold them accountable so, or, or with companies that in, impact federal programs. So when I was up there, we did the Enron investigation uh, and, and other companies, WorldCom, um, uh, Global Crossing, companies that were clearly cooking the books. Um, and, and there's nothing like exposing that. The, you know, there's nothing like exposing that to, to sunshine and having Congress inform themselves about how to fix those problems, how to address those issues in federal programs, and then, as I said, with private companies, as they're, you know, sort, of, you know, it, whether it's a consumer safety uh, issue or some sort of federal program that they're they're participating in. So, to Joe's point, lots of people think oversight's all about chasing headlines that members want to have a press release and and be featured in, in news stories and the like. But your point actually is good oversight done well can drive regulatory changes, can drive legislative changes can drive behavioral changes in the private sector. How do you know that oversight doesn't go too far in trying to force companies or the private sector to change behavior or force the, the government to go too far with its regulatory powers against the economy and the private sector? Yeah, I, I, it's a judgment call on each investigation what you're trying to get at, right? We looked at, back when I was up on the Hill, we looked at um, hospital billing of the uninsured. We wrote to the top 20 hospitals asking for their practices, and guess what? Just before the hearing, they all lowered their pricing. Right? Now, what got you guys interested in that? Reading the newspaper or, really? or talking to people. So it's reading the newspaper, talking to people involved with the process, talking to sometimes whistleblowers, things that get it on your attention. But the most important thing is to have that hunger to look at you know to look at issues, look at problems, and go attack them properly. And you're you're exactly right. I mean. You know, sometimes congressional investigations do get out of control, or they're 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 um, they're looking for the headlines, and they're not doing the work, right? I think the most important thing with congressional investigations is to to do it for the right reasons, right? Um, we were looking at a great program uh, or well-intentioned program for uh, wiring up schools across the countries, right? With with uh, with uh, the internet for back the internet. in back in the early days, and it's still going on. And the amount of waste that was going on in those programs, it sounds like a great program, but we, we went in there and we looked at boxes and boxes, warehouses full of equipment that had been purchased right, by school districts right, because they get these middlemen involved who say, hey, we'll oh, help you out. Yeah. Right? We'll help you out with the federal government. We'll, make, we'll, we'll fill out your application. We'll make it right so you get the most money. And a lot of these schools couldn't use it or they were moved on. To, we had one in Chicago where there was an entire warehouse of, uh, of equipment that had never been opened, was obsolete, millions and millions of dollars, right? And so what do you do with that, right? right. Um, it's waste. You know, is there fraud? Is there, the other thing is congressional inves investigations isn't looking to prove somebody's done something criminal, right? That's for the Department of Justice. That's for prosecutors. What it's to look at are our programs being run properly. You might run into, pro you know, a, a conduct like that, um, but it's to really look at how is this program running, right? And whether a we can bring it to the agency's attention, and 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 through that you know sort of oversight process, they make the changes themselves, or we pass laws. So Cong Congress passes laws to correct those those issues. Um, so to conduct oversight, 
you have yourself and, and fellow staffers, obviously members who are interested in issues. Uh, are there professional investigators? Do you have access to law enforcement or investigative resources? How do you go back to actually executing an investigation? Yeah, good question, Eric. Uh, it, it, the, the run out of committees, right? So up in Congress, Congress is divided up into about 20, at least in the House, representatives, 20 committees that are subject matter jurisdictions, right? The Education Committee, healthcare, sort of, a, which is in the sure. Energy and Commerce. But those, those have professional staff, and it depends on the size of the committee and how much is dedicated to oversight. But you might have anywhere from like three investigators, councils, whatever you want to call them, to 15, 20, maybe more, on a committee that are dedicated to doing you know, investigative work, okay? okay? So they're professionals and in their own life. Some of them are, are, are former prosecutors, but some of them, I wasn't a former prosecutor. I had worked in the White House Counsel's Office. I came up uh, to the Hill for 10, you know, for, it turned out to be 10 years. And you learn how to sort of, you know, from others and all to, to, to do investigations, right? You, and it's not, it's not rocket science in a way, right? It's, it's asking the right questions, learning about a program, working with the, the substantive people on a committee who understand a program, to sort of understand how that program is supposed to be working and then asking, you know, writing letters uh, that ask questions, asking for documents, uh, working with your members to get them sort of, you know, sort of ready for a hearing if you're going to a hearing. Um, but it's a, a very labor intensive uh, investigation. When we did Enron, we had over 500 boxes that came in from the company that we had to just pour through. But in that work, we found the document that was from one of the whistleblowers, Sharon Watkins, to Ken Lay, that showed that she was informing the, the then CEO or chairman uh, the, the, of some of the problematic uh, transactions that were going on. So let's talk about uh, right now, uh, Snapshot. Okay, we, we're in the week, well, as we're taping this, it's a week after the election. Yeah. Republicans will not take the Senate. Uh, although on the drive-in, NBC News projected that Republicans will take the House of Representatives, albeit uh, on a smaller margin than what was projected yeah. beforehand. So walk us through how they're going to get organized now. They're, they're shifting from the minority to the majority. Now in the House, they're going to have the ability to conduct investigations. What are they doing to get organized for that? And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the subjects which they might uh, want to want to focus on sure it would have been nice to have a bigger majority but at the end of the day you just need one vote uh, to have the majority to run committees and to pick topics that you're going to investigate that's what, essentially what the democrats have been doing right they've had a, a very small margin right now and they've run the house of representatives right and done investigations the interesting thing is they haven't done any investigations of the biden administration at all period full stop what do you mean they haven't they, they haven't, haven't done document anything? requests they haven't they haven't done hearings i think the medicaid director hasn't been up to testify since since uh, for two since, years for, wow. for, for, so i'm not sure when that person was uh, confirmed, confirmed but, but since the confirmation I, I read they they haven't been up at all so they haven't done anything um and then the republicans in the minority who have written to the to the agencies have gotten literally stonewalled at, on, on virtually every single request. So there hasn't been any oversight of the Biden administration in two years. And so now the shoe is on the other yeah, foot. Yeah. And Democrats no longer have the ability to, pr to protect, it sounds like, agency officials and the like from providing information to the Hill. So how does the new majority start out suddenly becoming chairs and conduct sure. oversight? So there's a couple, you know, like I, I brought along a letter that was um, uh, that, that uh, Jim Jordan wrote to Merrick Garland. Right. He's written 15 letters or so right mm -hmm. to the Department of Justice asking, infor, you know, asking for information and answers to, to, to things the department has been doing over the past two years, like setting up a domestic terrorist, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, office within the Department of um, Justice that seemed to be triggered by these parents that showed up at school boards, uh, oh, you know, yeah. to protest. Mm -hmm. Right. Or the um, uh, the attack on journalists. Uh, you know, uh, in terms of the Project Veritas raid, right? right. Um, and, and, get, and, and DOJ hasn't responded at all. So they have been writing on a number of issues. COVID, another one, which we'll talk about. But, you know, they've been writing letters. They've just gone, gone unanswered. So I think the Republicans have a roadmap of what they want to look at based on what they've been trying to get answers to for the past two years, right? That could be the Afghan, uh, Afghanistan pullout, right? The absolute tr debacle uh, and reckless uh, actions of, of President Biden and, and his team on pulling out of, of Afghanistan. 
of the COVID lockdowns, right? There's all sorts of things that they need to look at, the open border, wh why the, the administration has been acting the way they have, and, and looking at you know, what's been happening inside. So those age, those committees are getting set up, right? They're gonna go through elections as who's gonna run those committees. Staff is gonna, gonna kind of, they're gonna ramp up, higher. hire more staff, and then they're gonna re-up those letters out to those agencies. Um, and, and, and the agencies don't have to respond if they choose to. They can ignore, continue to ignore. So after the letters go out, yeah. depending how the agencies choose to comply or ignore, then what happens next? Are there, some people think, are there subpoenas? Are there requests for testimony? Are there requests for information that are stronger than just the letters in order ultimately to start surfacing information? Sure. I mean, um, letters are, are going to go out, I think, the agencies will answer them in a more limited fashion, right? right? They'll they'll answer them now that they're in the majority. They'll probably stonewall them in many ways in terms of giving any you know, real information. I think subpoenas would come next. Um, and my view is there's a lot of, you know, those decisions just don't happen at the top level, right? They, hop, they happen all through that agency in terms of getting something done, really? right? So it's so a student loan program. Like they, the, the Biden administration overturned a previous Trump memo, right, about the fact that the president didn't have the power to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Looking at who was interacting with the department on making that decision, right? It just got ruled unconstitutional by a district judge, right? This was all done right before the election, right? Same thing with like the, the, the uh, request to the Saudis to not um, curtail uh, oil production before the election. Things that are very political that look like they were you know, right before the election to change kind of the, 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 the outcome. And when you say who's interacting with these officials, are you talking people inside an agency or department, the outside, sure. both the White House? Yeah, it's t to me what the, the Congress is going to have to do is go after, kind of look at these agencies, but also look at companies and outside interest groups like the American Federation for Teachers, right, run by Randy Weingarten and what their interactions were with uh, Department of Education or with the White House and writing to that entity and getting those documents, getting their communication, Tell not me. just not just to the agency or the outside, but internally. Like th this was a big oh, player really? in those sorts of invest in, in, in those in those policies. And I think it's fair game and not just fair game, appropriate to go and look at that. Now, what happens with agencies and you saw this happen under the Obama administration and some under the Trump administration you know there's a back and forth between Congress and the administration right and it takes a long long time to get these things done and when you think about we can get into the process a little bit but if 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 an agency isn't producing documents to Congress Congress's you know a, a tool is to hold somebody in contempt right and in the house it's criminal contempt right you can um, so if you did that, where is that referral going? It's going over to the Biden DOJ, right? And so the likelihood of it, you know, the, the, the Biden Department of Justice, it's the U.S. Right. attorney technically, right. taking up a, a contempt against an agency where the, either the secretary or the president is, is telling the agency not it's to cooperate. It doesn't, right. right. You can actually authorize a, a, like a resolution to have the House file suit in district court to enforce the, 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 the subpoena. It's a civil enforcement, but that takes, you know, that'll take two years. And is that a kind majority of vote in the full house to, yeah. to take that yeah, step? Yeah. Okay. And so it's, a, it's you know, t to me, you, you need to do this oversight of the agencies of the Biden administration. They've been unaccountable for two years. But I think at the same time, you need to go to the companies and you need to go to, when I say companies, the outside groups, the, 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 the American sector. Federation for Teaching, because mm -hmm. it's a lot more difficult for them, in my opinion, to resist. And uh, why is that the case that the private sector has more difficulties in saying no thank you to legitimate congressional oversight than an agency or department? Because it's high stakes. I mean, you know, if you, if you get held in contempt, um, that might get re-upped um, later on down the road. It's, it's uh, you know, there's the... I'll call it the reputational issues that come okay. with defying a, a subpoena, right, and being held in contempt. Um, and I, I think it's, let, let's put it this way, will there be companies who resist it? Perhaps, right? But I do think to get a full, sort so, so, so of the, the full picture, picture and yeah. to go to every place that might have responsive documents to help the Congress understand what happened with these decisions, you need to go to those companies like right away. And in your experience, when you served up there as uh, the chief investigative counsel, your work with getting information out of the private sector yeah. was 
incredibly fruitful at the end of the day? Yeah, I mean, it, it was back and forth, but I, I, I know that with, I looked at Ford Firestone, if you remember the explorers that were having the big blowout, um, you know, rolling the over, tires, the tires were yeah. blowing out the Firestones and the explorers. Um, their counsel told me that they were looking to get a helicopter to bring the documents uh, and land them on, this before 9-11, to, um, to, um, um, uh, to the back of the, the Capitol to land the them. They were so the like, you know, and, and they, they did a scour of documents. Um, so it took a while. But yeah, companies don't want to. But that's tongue in cheek. I mean, he's saying that tongue in cheek. No, he, he wasn't. This- he was well, literally. They, they wanted looking, to make a huge demonstration of how. No, they important. wanted to. It was to get them on time. I think our deadline was like say two o'clock on a Monday or whatever it was, and they were trying to figure out how they were going to get them by the deadline. I, he told me this several years after, uh, and <laughs> um, nice. but we had the um, the Hewlett Packard uh, general counsel. We now again the other thing we'll talk about is just having hearings. Like you mm-hmm. could be trying to get documents, having people come up and testify under oath about what happened in their communications and what they want to do with um, Oracle, uh, I'm sorry, um, with Hewlett Packard, the general counsel uh, was going to take the fifth. So she resigned right before uh, the hearing uh, and then came in and took the, the fifth. This was on the what was called the corporate spying of Hewlett Packard oh, yes. uh, on their okay. employees. If you right. remember that, I, I, I investigated mm-hmm. that. And, um, and again, those are the kinds of things that are, I think people care about in Congress because it's different you know, when you think about, I'll go back to Enron for a second. Enron, we did seven or eight hearings that were very public. We had Jeff Skilling come in. We had, you know, Andy Fastow come in. We had lots of people so, come in. CEOs, CFOs, financial yep. officers, general counsel. And when the Department of Justice is looking at something, they go what I call r- r- kind of, they take a long time. It's a much higher level. It's a different job, but it could be in years in the making. And what we did is we pulled that, 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 that Enron happened in, I think, November of 2001. And we were having hearings by January, February of 2002 uh, and had a slew of them, as did some of the other committees. And that led to changes, um, you, you know, because it was Congress looking at it and the American people were able to watch it more. Uh, so what was unfolding to build that public support for changes. And changes were, besides Enron going bankrupt, so it had operational challenges, but changes included legislative yeah, changes legislation. Sure. and yeah. changes inside the industry as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So, so, so I, I, I'm a big believer. I think congressional oversight can be a force for good. And, you know, in every, in any industry, in any company, you have great performers, right? And, and people who have talents in other ways, right? And so there are great members of Congress or members of Congress who are great questioners, are great investigators, um, and you need to find them on each committee and work with them closely. And in my view, gentlemen, you know, every single committee in Congress needs to do oversight, uh, you know, for the next two years. Let's let's stop right there and we'll get into a little bit more granular discussion of some of the types of oversight investigations that the Republican House may get involved in. Maybe we'll talk about FTX, Afghanistan, and COVID would be three that we could talk to in a little bit more detail uh, but that'd be a great opportunity in our next segment to really dive into those in detail. So we'll do that. Sure. Stay tuned. <laughs> 